All right, well, in that case, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our, uh, is this our 10th installment? 11th. Our 11th installment of our Diversity Now series. Um, the first 10 were done weekly, and then we decided to uh, transition into a, a, a monthly delivery schedule. Uh, and then we'll transition back to a weekly come the spring. But uh, we wanted to make sure that we uh, continue to, to maintain the momentum that we've built over the last 10 weeks and uh, ended out on a strong note. Today, we have our own um, Dr. Michael Barber, who's going to be doing the second installment of his schooling during the crisis webinar. And so... Uh, we're going to be talking about not only the the crisis that occurred that which caused us to move to remote learning practice but uh, we're going to be talking about how uh, teachers and, and can triage in this in this type of situation and how we can make sure that we're meeting the demands of of our parents and families uh, to accommodate learning as much as possible so without further ado Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. All right, sounds good. Actually, you just said something in your comments there that made me think of uh, another image that I wanted to add. So I'm actually, um, it's funny. I always used to say that if I didn't have the plane ride to a conference, I'd never get any of my presentations done because that's usually when I do them. And today it seems it's when you're doing your introduction. Um, so I've just got a couple of basically images that I want to share just to get folks started to think about um, the topic. So I'm going to um, share into my PowerPoint here and um, let's get back up to the top. And hopefully that's coming through there. All right. So uh, first of all, you guys have a much more uh, focused of my attention than what uh, the crowd did, and I noticed Andrew and Dios are in the audience than what uh, we did at lunchtime, because this was my noon hour. Um, we had the Hispanic uh, Heritage Month, the last of those webinars that were going on that I was helping to facilitate with Andrew and Dios. And we had Faculty Senate that was on the go, and then we also had a, a system-wide instructional designers meeting uh, that was on the go. So I was in three specific meetings at the time. Um, all of which had a little bit of my attention and um, so but you guys have 100% of it today so when you think about sort of where we've come throughout the um, past few months so if you think about it I mean while we've gotten kind of used to everyone at home in front of a zoom screen or in front of a computer and uh, you know we in this remote working in this remote learning um, situation are sort of fortunate um, when you look back to march when things first started to happen and and this transition first happened you know this year was not an uncommon uh, site so this is something i actually pulled off of twitter a colleague of mine uh, tweeted it um, here in California, the, the Taco Bell in East Salinas. So if, if anyone is familiar with that area, you, you may know the location. I'm not sure. I've never been there, I don't think, unless I've been driving through. Uh, but you can see two children. They're actually both elementary school age children because I engaged the author afterwards or the poster afterwards. Um, and they're basically sitting outside of a Taco Bell and you can see they have handheld devices there. One is a tablet, one is actually a phone that they're using. And this is how they were engaged in their remote learning. This is how you know they were involved with um, when they started remote learning. And I, I present it like that and I say remember back to March and April when we first got into this. But the sad part of this is this picture wasn't posted in the spring. This picture actually came from the fall when we were supposed to have gotten beyond this emergency situation, beyond sort of triaging what we could do. And we had, you know, the whole summer for the department and school districts and individual schools and the leadership of all three of those entities to be able to sort of plan for some of this. But yet in, in the case of this, this one family, 
Um, obviously, you know, they didn't have access to the technology. They didn't have access to the internet. And this is what they had to do in order to access their learning. Um, on the other side of the equation, when you get onto the, the adult side of things, you know, you have situations like this. Um, you know, this is a CNN article that again came from the, the, the fall, where you had a, a series of um, teachers in a particular district in, in, in Western New York that basically decided that they were either going to quit or, you know, I've got a hundred and some odd days of sick time left, which will get me till about February. So let's start using it or the nature of, uh, you know, the, the contract that our union has with the district allows for that length of time. Um, so I'm going to, you know, just take a leave of absence and, and not subject myself to both the potential for contracting this illness, but in a lot of cases, it was because, again, districts and schools and departments of education across the country didn't have a good plan put in place. And so many cases, you had these situations where you had teachers showing up that, you know, we're supposed to teach one group of kids on Mondays and Wednesdays, another group of kids on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then on Friday, they were supposed to make up the 60% of the time with both groups of kids that they were supposed to be teaching online, which if you sort of add that up, is like 140% of a, a teacher's workload that they have to do on 100% of the time. Um, Mary Rice, who you may remember, was one of our presenters back in August, uh, I think probably in number five or number six in terms of the, the number coming through, or maybe number four, I can't, it's, it's been so long ago, and as EGOMA mentioned, we've had so many of these, it seems uh, like forever ago, but uh, this was something that she uh, posted, she was in New Mexico, um, their school year had started at the end of August, so this was, I think, the first or second week of their school year. Um, and she's in Albuquerque Public Schools in, in New Mexico. And I mean, just the, the way in which she frames this, you know, the conversation that she had with, you know, one of her daughter's classmates, um, it, it's really disheartening um, when you think about the fact that, again, and we titled this very specifically Beyond Triage because we sort of wanted to frame it in that sense. But as you can see here, um, that hasn't really moved that far behind. Um, many of you will probably remember this photo from uh, CNN, uh, which I think was coming out of a, a school in, or a parent, I should say, it's not a school, a uh, parent in Florida or somewhere in the Southeast where they had started schooling again, um, somewhere in the middle of third week of August. And as you can see here, I mean, you know, this is not what learning is supposed to be about, especially for a five-year-old, because, you know, as the caption says, this is a kindergartner. You know, this is a kid who's, you know, four, five, or six, depending upon when his parents decided to start him in school. You know, this is his first learning experience with formalized schooling, you know, and, and how is that going to impact, you know, how he perceives his education going forward. And, and as you can see, I mean, he's actually in kind of a fortunate situation. I mean, it looks like the kitchen there because that silver thing looks like the fridge. So he's got a little desk in the kitchen, uh, which is probably somewhere public where, where, you know, one or both of his parents uh, can keep an eye on him. You know, he's got a computer there. He's got a desk you know, and stuff. So he's got a specific learning space. Like it's not like the kitchen table or anything, you know, so he's got a physical location where he can go to school. So in terms of the structure that we sort of want to have in the home, and obviously he's in the home, so he's got a, you know, connectivity and stuff. Um, it seems like it's the setup that we would kind of recommend. Um, but yet you can see the, 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 experience that he's having, you know, the, the impact that the, uh, the, the transaction, the educational transaction is having on him. And just because it's not all doom and gloom, although so much of it is, if you haven't seen this video, I, I, I encourage you to go to Google and um, search for Mount Olive Elementary and um, synchronous class or online class. It's a roughly a 90 second video, but essentially the teacher's internet, I think it's in Tennessee, um, the teacher's internet essentially drops during class. So she leaves the class 
and you've got all of these kids, I think they're grade one or grade two, trying to figure out, okay, what do we do now that the teacher is gone? You know, is she coming back? Where'd she go? You know, she's still here. Does anyone see? Her? I mean, it's a wonderful, cute little clip, um, you know, and, and I sort of wanted to end there because I, I did want to end on a, a bit of a positive note in terms of those pictures. Um, while this is actually, a, this is the one that I added based on what you said, E.G. Uh, e. Omer, um, this is a, an interesting one that I, I've gotten from a, a blog, MindWires, which while they focus upon higher education, I think actually it's the path that you see in K-12, although I'd argue in the K-12 environment, the dates on the bottom aren't quite accurate. Um, but this idea that, you know, in phase one, essentially, we just, you know, did whatever we could and, and, and that was great and we were happy with, with whatever outcome we got. You know, phase two, we started to, you know, assess the situation and started to do things like provide, um, you know, the, the buses with the internet, provide the tablets and the Chromebooks and stuff like that. It started to get the teachers to add in some of the things that might have been missing from their instruction. As you can see from the dates, we should have been in phase three come September. You know, we're essentially, we've got the support in place. We've got teachers that have received professional development. We've had some orientations for parents and for students and those kinds of things. But, you know, I think you'd all agree. And for those of you that have kids or, or that have nieces and nephews in the system, you probably agree that in many cases, we're still back at the latter stages of phase one or still in phase two at this point. Um, so that's really sort of all I wanted to share to get folks thinking. Uh, I see that the chat has been a little bit uh, uh, busy while I've been sharing here. And I know that uh, E.G. Oman and Louise have probably got some questions, uh, probably had some queued up before they walked in the door. And hopefully that gave them a couple of other ideas. And uh, so we'll just have a conversation here now. And if folks do have uh, things they'd like to, to say, feel free to throw it into the chat in the form of a question or a comment. Thank you, Michael. Um, my question is more forward looking. Uh, now that we are, are looking at the, you know, last half of this semester uh, and, and fastly approaching the end of the year, and with that, the beginning of the new year, uh, a lot of schools are at a crossroads where you know, this, regardless of where we are at pandemic wise, I think a lot of schools are going to decide to go back into the classroom. Um, what are some things that we can take away from, you know, just this moment in time that we can, can expect to see in our classrooms come uh, January when there may be a, a return back to in, in school teaching? Well, I think that you've, you've pegged the timeline fairly accurately in, in January, because I think in the next month or so, as cold and flu season starts to begin, um, you know, as the weather starts to turn and, and we hit that, you know, end of October, November, early December, when cold and flu season starts, I think you are going to see, um, I was going to say a resurgence of the illness, but um, resurgence means that we've passed the initial surgence. And I'm not sure most states have passed that initial surgence yet, but um, I think what you'll find is that as bad as the numbers are now, uh, I think between now and Christmas, they're going to get worse. And the more those numbers start to turn in a negative direction and, and I know that, you know, we have no concept or no firm idea of what exactly will happen in the election, but, um, you know, that depending upon what happens there, we may see some change in direction in terms of the guidance and the push for how we go about, you know, do we open more or open less and what sort of things we put in place to maybe protect or not so much uh, against it. Um, but I think one of the things that needs to happen is a lot of the things that I think should have happened over the summer. And, you know, here in California, most of our teachers, with the exception of, you know, some of those charter schools and the private schools are unionized. So we had the issue of 
the, you know, many of the teachers unions were against bringing their members back early, especially early without pay and um, districts because of a, a funding crunch and because of a lack of additional funding coming from the state, which was due to a lack of a second stimulus package being passed by the federal government, um, you know, didn't have the money to pay them to come back. But the reality is, is the professional development that needed to happen, sort of the systematic logging of what are we doing in terms of what tools are we using, how are we using them, um, how are we using them in specifically an educational context, all of those things that should have happened either prior to school opening or, you know, delaying school opening, but bringing back the teachers so that could have occurred. Um, that's going to need to happen. You know, maybe it's we shut school down early for Christmas. So instead of getting, you know, the regular two week holiday break, we get a three week holiday break or maybe a four week where they take a week off of each side to provide that kind of professional development. Um, but I, I think that's going to need to happen because I don't think we are going to be coming back at, to the level of in-person learning in January that you will see that you see right now. Um, I think it's probably going to be delayed a little bit behind that, probably getting into February, maybe even early March. Um, essentially, once we get past that, that cold and flu, once we get out of the first wave and through the second wave, basically. Um, but I think those are the, some of the things that I think it, it's really teacher training. You know, it's, it's um, I see, you know, Mary is, is here uh, in the conversation and I know like some of the work that she's done with the, the Center for Students with Disabilities and Online Learning, or maybe it's Online Learning Students with Disabilities. I always forget how they trained that. Um, but I know one of the, the surveys that they did looked at the number of um, special education teachers that had some background and knowledge and understanding of um, online learning so that they could support those types of things and be able to build those types of things in the students IEPs and if I remember correctly it was single digits that actually had that um, that knowledge uh, studies done by you know Leanne Archambeau and Catherine Kennedy have found the same thing when they've surveyed teacher education programs across the country uh, the first time they did it they had like 400 odd responses and they had like 1.7 percent of the responses actually had anything in their pre-service or you know initial teacher preparation program to prepare teachers to be able to either teach or support students that were learning online. Um, Carrie Rice and Lisa Dolly, the study's about you know 10 years old now, but even they found that 40 only 40% 40 of actually teachers teaching at online schools had received any professional development on how to teach online. Um, you know, so when you look at those kinds of, of statistics and, and the fact that, you know, teachers just, they don't have firsthand experience of this as learners, we've never taught them how to do this um, as part of our teacher prep programs, we haven't provided them with PD in order to do it. I know that's a long-winded answer to say just we need more PD, but. Right, so if we looked at the professional development in particular and it just kind of went in with a close-up lens, um, I'm wondering if districts were to like maybe create three tiers perhaps of, of, you know, one level of training, a different level of training, and a third level of training for wherever those teacher entry points might be. What are your thoughts or what recommendations or what is the research showing in terms of what might be three solid pockets where, where districts could really invest time, energy, and attention into helping teachers scale up into this work? Um, actually, it's interesting you mentioned three because uh, I have three in mind, particularly that I, I would have answered regardless if you what number you had given. Um, the first is teachers need to know just how to use the tools that the district has authorized. Um, you know, and it's not just use it at a surface level. Um, the example I always use because you know I'm a child of the the 80s. You know, the teachers in my day could bring the the VCR into the room and they could you know put the the tape inside the VCR but none of them could figure out how to fix that flashing 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock on the VCR. Um, you know, so the first thing that I think we need to do that level one, if you will, is just to teach them sort of the basic troubleshooting aspects of here's how to use the technology so that when their students or the parents that are supporting this at home run into an issue, 
you know, they can walk them through some of the basics, you know, in a couple of minutes. Um, the, the second level, I think, and, and this is the part that I think we often fall down upon just with educational technology training in general. We teach teachers how to use technology. We don't teach them how to teach with technology. You know, I mean, if you, the best example I can think of, if you look at the way most kids use technology today, you know, they all have a surface level understanding of how to use the technology for things that they find meaningful and purposeful. But if you actually ask them to do something productive with it, um, they can't, you know, their, their knowledge of it is, is uh, often turns turned to a mile wide and an inch thick. And, you know, there's a difference between us being able to just, you know, log into Zoom, share a screen, run a poll, you know, watch the chat, those kinds of things, and the ability to actually teach effectively with it. You know, the text, the chat message that Mary just posted to the panelists, um, you know, about a minute ago was the first thing that they've said since Egeoma asked his first question. So obviously the way in which I was using Zoom throughout my whole first response didn't engage the audience enough to want to react to it in some way. You know, maybe if I had specific questions, you know, so that difference between using it and using it to teach, using it for pedagogical purposes. And then the, the third tier is there are gonna be folks out there that just take to this a little bit easier than others, or may already be fortunate enough that they're coming with some of these skills. You know, let, there needs to be some training that would take those teachers to the next level, um, you know, because they're going to essentially become the teacher leaders in your group that are going to push others to do more and more with their, their technology teaching in much the same way that, you know, in every single school building out there, there are a lot of teachers that just come in and, and you know, they'll, you know, do their lecture or do their group work or whatever they happen to be good at. And that's about it until the guy, you know, next door or the gal, you know, three doors down starts doing something innovative and creative and the students start talking about it. And, you know, they get interested in it and excited about it or maybe just pushed along because the students are forcing it, you know, but you need that sort of advanced level training for that smaller group of, of teacher leaders that you have there. Michael, you really are. Uh hitting it out the ballpark today just in terms of you know the thoroughness uh, of the answers to these questions uh, one of the questions that that I have for you is is just what are the long-term implications if we decide you know collectively as a community that you know we do want to remain in remote learning um, I'm looking at the numbers they're, they're beginning to spike again. You know, it seems like we've been down this rodeo a few times now. Um, but it, it also dawns on me that there is a possibility that we may have a full year of remote learning. What are the implications for our, our youth, for our kids, if they have to spend a full year in this particular format? Well, I think the, the, the big question is which kids, um, you know, because there's going to be a group of kids that, I mean, we could have given them a textbook the day after Labor Day and said, okay, you're going to be tested on this in June, and they would have done fine, regardless if they'd never stepped foot in a classroom. Um, I, what concerns me, and in all honesty, I think the, I can't call it a blind spot because everyone sort of knows about it but there's no good answers or solutions to it. You know, I look at a lot of the folks that are in our community in Solano County. And, you know, we, we have a, um, at least by Bay Area standards, you know, a, a higher percentage of, of free and reduced lunch students that are in Solano County. Uh, we have a lot of that particular population of students have parents that fall into those essential worker categories or that don't have the ability to work remotely. Um, those are the kids I'm concerned about. Those are the kids I'm worried about. And, you know, as much as I can sort of say, here's all the things I think we should do, um, a lot of that is going to take time, resources, and in particular money. 
And unfortunately, because in the US we fund education through local property taxes, in many cases, the communities that need the most in terms of these types of supports are the ones that have the least ability to provide it. Um, you know, so the, you get into the question of you've got those five or six students that, um, you know, in, in your out of the 30 kids in, say, my grade three class that I'm dealing with, you know, who are coming from single parent homes, who's, you know, that one parent has to work outside the home. So the child is, you know, unsupervised or, you know, has to rely upon volunteerism from friends and family to just be able to engage on a daily basis with their studies, assuming that we've gotten a piece of technology into their hands and assuming we found a way around, you know, the, the all of the digital equity issues. Um, you know, what do we do for, for those six kids in my grade three class? And, you know, I mean, Schools could, you know, engage their, their, their parent teacher associations, could engage community groups. You know, we hear a lot in the media about learning pods and, and so often it's focused around, you know, these, um, in many cases, middle class or upper middle class families, oftentimes, you know, in white suburban areas, because those are the people that have the flexibility to be able to, you know, do, dedicate the time and to be able to arrange for these learning pods, you know, at their home with the, you know, the community of kids that are, you know, well, I can think just around, sorry, my windows that way. So that's why I'm looking out, you know, but just outside my window, I mean, you know, there's two high schoolers across the street. Next door to me, there's, you know, a kid in grade five. I know the family across the road from me has got a kid in grade three and another in grade six. You know, in theory, I'm at home all day long. You know, I've got good internet here. You know, I could work with them to, you know, help them and engage a learning pod, you know, but how many kids in, in, in um, you know, how many parents of, of children in a lot of the communities we serve are in that position? You know, and, and that's one of the areas where I think schools can sort of step up and, and start to, you know, look for these types of opportunities, you know, engage with community groups that, that are able to, um, you know, to um, help coordinate these kinds of things. Um, you know, a, a lot of cases, you know, there, there's small businesses in, in the, the community that, you know, might be willing to put in some money, particularly if it's, you know, a, a franchise or chain, you know, where they've got a, a larger thing to draw, you know, larger wealth to draw upon that can help fund some of these local initiatives in their community. Um, you know, but it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because my biggest fear, and I think it's a fear that's going to be realized, is, you know, as much as we have a two-tier education system now, you know, one for the rich and one for the poor, and, and unfortunately, you know, socioeconomic status so commonly um, correlates with race in, in not just here in, in the U.S., but in, in North America in general. Um, you know, essentially, we've got a, a separate but equal system or separate but unequal system, sorry, that is developing around those that have access to learning and have access to these resources and those that don't. And I fear that this is going to exacerbate it, and, and I don't see good solutions to it. Um, as you were talking, one of the things that I was thinking about is our teachers. And I don't know if this is uh, something that you've put much thought into, but um, I will tell you, I was, I was on the phone not on the phone, I was on a, a call with one of, you know, my teacher colleagues the other day, and it was right after school, and she was, like, exhausted, kind of at her wits end. Uh, one of the things that she said she had been dealing with, and I've seen a little bit of, of this comment in the, uh, in the chat, was right now it is her daughter, her two sons, her husband, and herself are all at home on Zoom. And not only is the internet, you know, a challenge, but, you know, one of her sons is uh, in the first grade. And though 
you know, he has a teacher online, he feels like mommy is his teacher, right? Like, and so she's, she's kind of juggling all of these things, right? Because it's not just teaching that she has to worry about. It's teaching, parenting, et cetera, et cetera. What are some things that our teachers can do to just kind of maintain not only their sanity, but, but to make their job a little bit easier as they're navigating this? Um, well, there's, I think, first of all, there, there's, there's um, a couple of things that immediately come to mind. Um, the first, and this is something that school leaders could have done at the beginning of the year, but um, in all honesty, I think most didn't. So it falls upon individual teachers, but is to engage with their parents to orient them about what their expectations are in this situation. You know, in the same way that t prior to March, the vast majority of teachers had no background training or experience in this, neither have the parents, neither have the students, you know, and, and in much the same way that, you know, I was talking with a reporter the other day and the example I used was it's like trying to get your driver's license. And when you're learning how to drive, you're, you know, and it, the reporter just happened to be in New York. I said, you know, you're, you're learning how to drive on a, one of these 24 wheelers down in, you know, midtown Manhattan. You know, I mean, because that's essentially what they're, they're doing, you know, to, it made more sense to him because it was in Manhattan. But uh, another way of looking at it is like you're trying to drink through a firehouse. I mean, that's really the experience that these folks are having. now. So they, they don't have that background and, and that, that firsthand, you know, as a student, this was what it was like for me in this context. So teachers engaging with the parents and saying, you know, here's the expectations that I have of you. One of which is that you shouldn't be the primary teacher. Yes, you're probably going to be the person that's, you know, making sure that they're paying attention and on, you know, their computer or engaged in whatever that you, you have them doing. But you shouldn't be the person that's responsible for teaching. You know, and, and here's some of the things that, you know, if you see X or Y or Z, you know, that's when you want to reach out to me by phone or by whatever and, you know, try to um, engage me in that context so that I can uh, get involved. Because when you look at these full-time online programs that existed prior to the pandemic, so these, these cyber charter schools, that's one of the first things that they do when you become a, a student in these programs is they will have a, what they call a learning coach orientation. Uh, which for them, the learning coach is the parent or the guardian, whoever's going to sort of oversee the, the student while they're learning. And they go through and they've got documentation and, and books that they send out and stuff like that. That talks about, you know, here's the things that as the school and as the teacher, we expect of you. Here's the things that, you know, we don't want you to do, we don't need you to do. And, and, and if you find yourself doing these, that's when you want to, you know, reach out to us, because I'm not there to see that it's happening. You know, so you need to tell me that this is happening. So that way I can try to, you know, give, get involved in the situation to prevent that. Um, so that's one of the, the first things that, that I would suggest to teachers is you want to sort of educate your parents as to what their role is in all of this, because they're new to it. They've never had to do this before. Um, the other thing that I would recommend is to, particularly at the younger ages, is to find ways to provide, you know, present the curriculum or to get students engaged in the learning that doesn't involve sitting in front of a screen. Um, you know, and I think that's good for digital equity reasons, um, but I also think it's good for that, you know, you, we all know how exhausted we feel at the end of the day these days, <laughs> sitting in front of the computer, sitting in Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. You know, you can only imagine how the 10-year-old feels, um, you know, or that five-year-old that I had in, in the, the slides at the beginning. Um, you know, at, at least it's acceptable for him just to sit there and cry at the end of the day. You know, we sort of have to, to, to suck it up and, and at least put on a brave face with these kind of things. But, um, you know, trying to find ways that, you know, you have them 
doing things that you know are involved you know that involve using manipulatives um, have them writing or coloring or designing things on paper and pencil have them you know reading traditional books uh, you know using the the environment that's around them you know be it things that they're likely going to find you know out you know on the, the sidewalk outside their house or in their backyard or what they might find in their kitchen those kinds of things so that you can get them away from from the screen um, yeah there's a couple of ahead. points I want to tease out before you go any further so the first one when you talk about the learning coach I think what's problematic in that is that that really is basically uh, this is my jaded opinion that's homeschooling right so unless you have a parent who has the resources to commit themselves to being a homeschooling parent they don't have the bandwidth to be the learning coach because they're on their Zoom meeting for their work and they need that paycheck coming into the house. Um, or in many cases, especially in our local area, parents need to leave the house to go to their job because they are essential workers. And then so they don't have the resources or connections or network to have their child in a, in a learning pod, right? So the student is really at whatever age you can imagine at home really self-reliant and so I think there's a false assumption within that construct about learning coaches of what parents can and cannot do and it feels like nobody ever stopped to kind of take stock of parent capacity and I and you know I love building partnerships with parents and I Absolutely. Um, you know, if always when I was a school principal, I always felt like I was sharing parenting with my parents because we just had that type of an open relationship where we were going back and forth about I'm responsible for your child during these hours and I am going to call and you support for these things. And so like there was clear role delineation of who's doing what we haven't even done like a basic role delineation. Right. And so, so I'm hoping maybe you could pause and, and maybe loop back to that a little bit in terms of how might some teachers or districts or whatever kind of re reach out right knowing that we didn't really kind of cover it in the first time around but now at this point in the pandemic how can we in a focused way reach out to parents and craft some type of viable partnership where we really are attending to the best needs of the student the second piece that you were talking about which which i love it because it's authentic learning it, it has all those great marks and at the same time the tension is there that the you know many districts and schools that they're just marching along to like oh and standardized testing is coming along so you're all online but you're still going to do standardized testing and so teachers necessarily don't have the luxury to stop and do you know authentic instruction in a, in a remote environment just as you described by having them really interact with their world and engage off of the screen because they've got the standardized test coming up and now they're even being held you know to that regardless right so so i'm wondering about how might we partner with parents re-partner with parents um and how might we suggest to teachers they try to integrate maybe some smaller pieces of authentic learning knowing that they still have to you know hit that drum beat of being ready for the standardized test with their students sorry two very long questions <laughs> No, that's that's fine. And I'm glad you mentioned the, the learning coach thing because it actually does bring up one of the the big differences between your traditional full time online learning that you see particularly provided by a lot of these for profit EMOs that run the cyber charters and the remote learning that's there. You know, one of the reasons and you, you said, you know, uh, I can't remember the term you used, but it was uncharitably homeschooling. Um, it's kind of funny. I smiled when you said that because I always call it glorified publicly funded homeschool because um, that's what I think it is. Um, in those cyber charters, in many cases, the because they're being run by for-profit corporations, the um, the model that's in place tends to be one that's driven by profit over over learning. Um, so your traditional a cyber charter school, an elementary school teacher would be, you know, responsible for 80 to 100 students. Whereas, you know, you walk through any um, elementary school in, 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 you know, Solano County and you'll find maybe 25 to 35 students in most of them, I'd imagine. Um, you know, so I think one of the big differences between the, the parent who is in the remote learning situation now and the parents say 12 months ago who was in a cyber charter school is that 
the teacher that they have is responsible for a third less students now than what you would have found in these cyber charters. So that allows them to do more. Uh, the reason why the cyber charters are glorified homeschooling is because the instructor basically, because the teacher becomes an on-demand tutor and nothing more. Whereas if you look at the teachers that we've got engaged in remote learning now, um, I, I think we could probably describe their instructional role as being at least somewhat consistent with what they would have been doing 12 months ago. Um, or at least their intent and efforts are in the way in which it's structured is set up that way. Um, but one of the things that, you know, you talk about, you know, how can schools do this sort of reckoning so that we can, you know, do this better. Um, you know, if we are bringing students back or if we are bringing some students back, you know, one of the things that, that we need to look at is we need to look at this from an equity perspective. You know, if I had children right now, you know, assuming that, you know, I, I had students that didn't have any sort of special needs or anything like that, because of the nature of my work, they could stay here. There's no reason that they need to go back to the building. You know, whereas, you know, my neighbor three doors down, who's a single mom and a nurse, you know, she works 12 hour shifts, seven out of 14 days. Her child needs to go to the school and needs to go to the school every day that she happens to be working, right? And, you know, so why we have a situation where in some districts, and even if it's not happening right now, when we start bringing students back, this is the model that they're invariably going to use. My kid will go back to school on Mondays and Wednesdays. Her kid will go back to school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. You know, how is that equitable? in terms of, of the access to quality education, just the access to education in general, forget quality, you know, the access to education for those two children, you know, it's not. Um, so I think one of the things that, that schools and, 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 and teachers need to do now is start finding out, you know, what are the individual needs of the students that they're serving? And not in terms of the specific learning needs, but just the situational needs. You know, who has the ability to stay home and, you know, has the trappings of what's needed to learn remotely, the support that's needed to remote, learn remotely, and who doesn't? Who has the support but not the, the tools, you know, so that we can get the tools into their hands and not just figure out, okay, we've got 5,000 kids, let's buy the best device we can if we give them to all 5,000 kids. You know, if only 3,000 of the kids need it, then you can get a better device or you can use that funds to buy, you know, better technology, better tools that are being used by the teachers with all of those students. You know, and, and to me, that's a, a, a more equitable approach to, to take with these things. And it starts with the teachers and the schools finding out what are the individual needs of the students that they're serving. You know, even just to the point of, of where are they located? You know, are there like five of you that are, you know, within a, a, a certain vicinity of, say, this, this, this church building or this service community organization that, you know, and, and instead of having the teacher, you know, be resident in a school where they're by themselves or have an online teacher, you know, this is the other thing schools have started looking at is having some teachers that are teaching 100% in the classroom, some that are teaching 100% online. You know, why do I need to be teaching? If I'm teaching 100% online, I don't need to be in school. I could be at home, but I could also be sitting in some community center somewhere where I've got, you know, eight socially distanced kids from families that, you know, don't have the ability to stay at home with them. And now they've got a teacher that's seeing them and we're not having to bring them into the school. We don't have to worry about busing because this community center is all, you know, within a mile or a quarter mile of where they live kind of thing. You know, so these are the things that, you know, I think that we should be looking at that I don't think we have been. Michael, it's funny that you uh, said all that because I was just thinking to myself, uh, Louise and I were just having this conversation this morning. Like it, it, it almost is, is one of those exact things that had came up. Um, just keeping an eye on, on the time uh, I don't, I don't have any other, uh, questions. Louise, did, did you have any 
any other questions that you wanted to ask? No, I did want to just um, kind of give a nod to some of the great comments in the chat because, you know, Mary Rice has just really shared the, the perspective that so much of the PD was just on directives, right? It wasn't, even, it wasn't even training or PD. It was just like, you can do this on video. You can't do that on video. It wasn't necessarily a training up to use the tools. And so I think that's an important note to think about how can we, again, repartner with our teachers, just like we need to repartner with the parents. How can we repartner with teachers and then say, oh, okay, what do you need? Maybe we just even need to pull them, right? Find out what they do need and then offer um, some resources along those lines. I know that some of the um, districts, for whatever reason, I don't um, understand all the back end of it yet because this is new information I just received a couple of days ago um, that there there are some big pockets of funding that is surprisingly coming to districts a lot of it having to do with the pandemic and it is one time kind of use it or lose it money so it seems like there are opportunities that districts might have to take that one step back do a little polling figure out what's needed and then pay for some strategies some support some resources to to help with the course correction because back to your slide michael i just you know i agree that the curve and everything is probably off because it probably started low and then went lower you know just kind of an implementation dip and there was probably a lot of uh erotic stuff at the beginning instead of it tried to make it look like there was kind of a smoother curve before the eroticness hit um, and so I just feel like we're, we're, it's more like if the line were a true line, it's almost like a, um, like you would see on a heart monitor, right? Where there's just steady pieces and then all of a sudden a dip and then steady pieces and then a high point and steady pieces and where it, you know, this, our experience of, of implementation of education for our K-12 students is still, um, inconsistent at best, erratic at worst, and then the, the opportunity to pause. And so it makes me even wonder, like, you know, Lisa was also talking about, you know, as an anchor institution, like how do we partner? Like maybe we could even construct like a survey that we send out to districts to say, you know, here are three recommendations, uh, conduct a survey, do X, Y, Z. Here are two ways we can help you if you're interested. Um, Cause I really do feel like this, there is this necessary coming together, right? As communities of support. Um, to really be vital parts of our school districts. You know, you, you, you talk about it on such a beautiful level just in terms of your neighborhood, right? Where you know your neighbors, you know, you know, you can think of ways off the top where they can come together and, you know, make some connections. Um, but how might we facilitate that for people who haven't thought about how to do that outreach to do the repartnering, repartnering with parents, repartnering with teachers, taking a step back, pulling for needs, and then putting together a plan to move forward more strategically. So I'm wondering, like, what are your thoughts, you know, around, around that, um, you know, just any type of approach that maybe as an anchor institution, we could, um, we could take? Well, I, I think your idea of, of putting together some sort of survey that we could provide to districts, not necessarily the actual survey questions, but giving them sort of, you know, categories, if you will, um, you know, things that would be useful for you to find out about your parents, um, you know, and really making sure that you have a high response rate with that, which is really going to require, you know, teachers to engage with the parents of the students that they have, because for most families, you know, the school really is the, my child's teacher. You know, a lot of them wouldn't even be able to tell you, you know, who most of the other personnel at the school are, but they all know their child's teacher, right? That's their sort of direct connection. Um, so, you know, but because I haven't seen a lot of folks do this well. You know, I've seen uh, several districts and, and ministries actually in, in Canada that, you know, surveyed folks, but it was more along the lines of finding out what percentage would want to be in person compared to what would want to be remote, you know, and, and that's a totally different thing, you know, wanting to be in person and having no choice but to be in person are two very different states, right? And while it's, you know, while it might be useful to find out, you know, if I had a choice, would, you know, would I want to send my child to school? Um, that's useful information. It's much more useful to the only way my child is going to get an education during the daytime is if 
they're in the school building. Um, you know, and that's critical information to have. Um, you know, finding out the types of technologies that are around. Uh, one of the things that I'm amazed that districts didn't do back in, in May and June is just find out what tools people were using and how students, you know, how receptive they were to things. You know, how did they work? Um, you know, how did students take to them? You know, did they find that, you know, the, the students were able to, you know, manipulate them and use them in ways that the teacher had intended? because that would have given them the summer to basically say, okay, you know, here's the tools that we think worked well, you know, here's tools that we don't have, you know, something that works well, we tried X and Y and they didn't work. So let's find out, you know, what else is on the market in this area to be able to, to do that. You know, we've seen these stories uh, coming up over the, the past month, you know, in places like down in, in San Diego and, and, um, the state of Hawaii and in Arizona, where you have these content providers that districts have bought into that are providing charitably, you could say questionable content, uh, particularly questionable content around, um, in many cases, around race. Um, you know, and, and these districts now, as parents are starting to go to the media and say, like, can you believe that this is something that's in my child's curriculum? type thing. Um, you know, this is all, it, it gives us a chance to sort of sit back and start to look at some of these things. Um, you know, there's a lot of, even just when you look at that at issue of curriculum, you know, you, you've got these canned things that you can buy that you're starting to see all these problems with in the media. You've got some districts that are asking teachers to create their own stuff, which to me just boggles the mind altogether. And then, you know, there's very little effort that's gone into looking at the wealth of resources that are currently out there and, and working with teachers on how do we curate those types of things. Um, and that's not something that should be done at the teacher level. It's not something that should be done at the school level or even at the district level. That's something that departments of education should have started doing, you know, the second that school closed in, in the spring. They should have started looking at, okay, you know, let's go through and create this online repository of all these resources that can be used to cover off all of our curricular outcomes throughout the course, because while we don't know if it's going to happen at the beginning of the school year, based upon everything that we know about how the way pandemics work, the kids are going to be remote at some point. So while we might not use it, you know, in August or September, we'll use it in October or it might be December or March or whenever. But if we've got it all there, at least then it's ready for when we need to use it. Because there's no reason why, you know, a, a, a teacher, a third grade teacher in Vacaville Unified has to do the exact same work that a teacher down in Vallejo Unified is doing. You know? But in so many cases, they are right now. Um, I think I only gave you one example of something you could do at the University, Louise. Um, obviously, professional development is one that, that comes to mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at um, even minute types of things, you know, like as faculty, um, you know, like I look at someone like, you know, Dr. Haynes is incorporating Flipgrid into her mm -hmm. teaching this mm -hmm. semester. You know, having Dr. Haynes available for a 30 minute session to work with uh, teachers, particularly in her case, because she's a special ed faculty, you know, special education teachers on how they could use Flipgrid in their own teaching. You know, every one of our faculty members are using some tool okay. in a creative way be it just, you know, how they've set up their learning management system or the way in which they do a synchronous class in Zoom to get more engagement, you know, and finding those little tidbits, you know, these 30 minute sessions, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. where you're, you're a little bit on how to use the tool, a little bit on how to use it to teach, and then a lot of time for teachers to ask questions. Yeah, that's really helpful. It gives me ideas for it. Because I think, you know, in my conversations with um, cabinet level leadership at the districts, um, you know, I've, I've suggested, you know, we are here, we're a resource. And I think I would characterize it as them being so deep within the problem, they don't even know what help to ask for. 
Um, and so, you know, the feedback loop for me is to think about how can I come with more of a proposal in hand, almost thinking about it like a, like, like private work, you know, like a private entity would come in with kind of some proposals, say, here's what we can offer you, X, Y, Z, are you interested? Uh, because they don't necessarily know how to throw out the lifeline. They don't know what that lifeline should look like, and they don't even know where the rope is to throw it out, <laughs> you know, because they're oh, just I, I very, right? It was only last week I was working with a, a district up in Alberta, Canada, that um, they have a um, once a month, they basically take a half day, um, usually a morning, to essentially do some, some focus PD. And they were in exactly that boat. You know, it's as the district was trying to come up with something, what in the world are we going to do it on? Um, so they mm -hmm. set up an ed camp kind of thing where basically they mm -hmm. had all of these different sort of open areas that, that had sort of broad themes and you showed up to, to one of those. And so they actually invited me into one of them and the folks in the room sort of came up with, you know, what are the, some of the topics we want to talk about? And then they created these breakout rooms around those topics and um, the district sort of sent facilitators into each of the rooms just to find out about it. And now they're planning um, later this, actually I'm not sure if it's later this month or beginning next month, I think it's beginning next month. They're planning a full day Friday um, session that is based around topics that came out of these different ed camps. And, you know, now they've got sort of a month to, to put it together and to get you know, some folks that have real expertise in these areas and that can provide some concrete suggestions and advice for the teachers that are struggling with these different terms. You know, so they're able to essentially use that EdCamp model as a way to generate sort of the agenda or program um, for this next larger event that's going to happen. The I think it's the 9th of November is they're planning it. So I see we're getting to the bottom of the hour. So uh, I'm going to say we're getting close to the end here now. So I'm going to hand it over to Egioma again. And uh, so he can uh, preview our last session for 2020 and uh, which will be coming up in, a, I guess it's four weeks time. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, this was another great session. Uh, you're right. We do have one more Diversity Now webinar in 2020. And I am happy to say that uh, it is going to be a webinar that is based on the TV show that I'm developing that's going to be highlighting educators of color. And so um, the title of that webinar is Black Academics. We're asking all of you who are here today to uh, uh, chime in that day. We're going to be premiering our pilot episode and we're going to be anxious to hear all of your feedback in terms of uh, what you like, what you didn't like, what we could do better, uh, and whether or not this is a concept that we believe can actually have some positive impact on the very things that we've been talking about over the last 10 weeks, which is how do we create more diversity uh, in our system how do we make our system more responsive to what children and families really need? And so uh, really excited uh, for that uh, and excited that we've had opportunity to have such a successful webinar series up to this point. So um, with that being said, uh, Michael, if you have anything else? No, I think uh, you've sort of summed it up. Uh, that'll bring us to an even dozen. Um, as we finish out 2020, which I think is a, a, a good number. And uh, just to let the crowd know that uh, I guess it's the, what we decide, the end of February is yes. when we will be starting back up in the spring. So if you aren't able to join um, us in November, um, first of all, be sure to check out the recording that goes up on the uh, website, and I'll post that in the chat here in a second, um, or rely upon um, Lisa, Dean Norton, or uh, Louise to uh, post it in there. Um, and uh, we'll be starting the end of February again and going for 10 weeks on a weekly session. And uh, hopefully you'll find the spring offerings uh, with a new year to be uh, just as good or better. And 
uh, hopefully with the new year comes uh, a new perspective and, and maybe even new optimism um, for this uh, particular topic. All right. Well, with that being said, uh, Michael, thank you again. Luis, thank you. And uh, we'll see all of you in a month.